I thought maybe we could start with your story. What's been happening in St. Johnsbury, Jamie Dimmick? Well, there, <clears throat> it might be easier to say what's not happening in St. Johnsbury. It's <laughs> been a pretty incredible March and April. Um, at Kingdom Access TV, we always have a very busy March. Uh, we do a rotary basketball tournament, and in about 10 days, we turn out, uh, I think it's 42 basketball games. So right as we finished that, the state, uh, you know, gave a stay at home order. I think it was the Friday and we did the finals on Saturday. But um, at that point, we just kind of uh, regrouped trying to figure out what we were going to do. And the next week on Wednesday, I think it was the uh, 16th or 18th of uh, March, Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium was going to do a live COVID-19 update with the local hospital. So I reached out to them at about 11 o'clock in the morning and said, um, would you like us to do this live? And they said that would be great. So then I realized what I had said and they had taken me up on it. So we very quickly had to figure out a way to go from YouTube to KETV to cable TV. And lucky for us, um, I think I'm guilty of never throwing anything away. And the people that work here would testify to that. So we dug around and found the equipment that we needed and put it together very quickly for one o'clock. And that really opened up um, a, an amazing partnership with Fairbanks Museum. Um, to date, we've done, I think, 63 educational programs with the museum. We've been sending them out on VMX, um, had tons of downloads, I think over 600 downloads from VMX for those shows. And that's just been a great thing, keeping us busy, uh, helping an institution in our community and uh, putting valuable stuff out there. That sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. Tammy Riley, you're down in Manchester, GNAT. Tell us how your organization has made the pivot in the last six weeks in terms of the service provided to the community? So, of course, the first two weeks were crisis mode and we were meeting on a daily basis as a staff and really trying to determine what is it that people need, right? And that took a couple of weeks for everybody to get settled. What's been really interesting for us is um, we're seeing more community participation I think because people are willing to have willing to try something new because they have time, their schedules are disrupted. So we produce the news project, we produce regular weekly news stories. So we are a content producer. But what's been really interesting about what's happened over the last six weeks is that it's the the disruption has allowed people to try new things. And we've you know, and it's really bringing us back to our mission to empower people. And so that's really exciting. Um, in particular, we reached out to the faith community because that was immediately a big need in, in the community. And so uh, one of my producers is on the phone in Zoom daily with various faith leaders, helping them with Zoom, helping them with the iPad, you know, sorting out internet issues. And I think that's really been huge. Um, the, the other things we were doing, um, and I think we're sort of settled now, is reaching out to all the government entities, making sure that they could get their meetings covered and, and let them know that we were there and helping them in that way. And the other piece, which is always the most fun for me, is, is seeing the kids get involved. Um, so we started a kids variety show where, where kids and parents can send in their, their own content um, and we put it together. So it, it took, you know, everything takes longer than you wanted to, but we're kind of hitting our stride with all of this stuff. So that's sort of what's been going on here. Um, in addition to us producing regular news content via Zoom, um, it, it's been exciting. And it's exciting to see new people come into the fold with what we do and share their story and tell stories that aren't getting told otherwise. So that's, that's what's making me excited. Thanks so much, Tammy. Jared, I understand that you put together a uh, kind of musical concert away, and obviously you're a musical man from yeah. your room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is my music room. Uh, uh, I, it's still a challenge of getting the content. I've been reaching out. Um, my first attempt hasn't really, really worked out the way I've liked, but I'm, 
I have, I do have some community members who are regulars who do music programs and I'm reaching out to them now to try to do something via zoom. Uh, in the town I'm in, not it's, it's actually, uh, in a CATV's area, but there's a little, uh, tavern here that puts on a zoom open mic, which is the kind of the same idea I've had. I've actually participated a couple of times. So I'm, I'm working on that aspect with the local musicians in Springfield, Chester. So, yeah, so that, that's one of the biggest challenges I've found is, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking outside the box of how to get the content, but still getting the community members to get the content created is, is still a bit of a challenge for us, but, but there, you know, we're, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing that people are starting to gravitate towards the zoom, especially some of our like studio, shows uh th that we had regular studio shows i have a feeling some of them will probably say you know what i like doing this out of the living room of my home can we keep doing it this way so so i think that this that given this option we will start to see more content via the you know teleconferencing and stuff so but yeah overall i think that is one of our hardest challenges is just getting the people used to the idea like hey you can still create content you can still send it to us and, uh, and, but we are seeing an uptick in that finally, and hopefully we're going to continue to see that. So, but overall we, uh, we, we, uh, gravitated to the remote, uh, thing pretty well. We I actually, the, the, literally the day before the stay at home order was put in place, I had met with my board and I had, I'd come up with like, well, if, you know, this is, situation happens, this is what, you know, me as the director is going to do. This is what my, uh, my production coordinator is going to do and I come up with a logistical plan saying we will be able to work, but we're going to do it remotely. And it wasn't a day later that we were told do not go into work, you know? <laughs> so, so overall we, we were prepared. It just came a lot sooner than we were expecting. And, and there's some challenges to it, but we are, we are making do and zoom has been a, and, and teleconferencing has definitely been a big help in doing that. Thank you so much. Cor, can you tell us a little bit how you've made the switch from a regular community media center to a remote, a remote media operation? To, to my operating a TV station from my basement. That's, I wasn't going to actually say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is, folks. Um, yes. I mean, like many of you, and um, I got uh, so many of our ideas from our daily what well, started out as a daily van call. So I just really appreciate that uh, all that input was there because they gave me all sorts of ideas about what other stations were doing. Um, we jumped in first on the municipal level because um, our towns were all at various stages of being able to go online. So we jumped in at the like, you know, there was a hybrid phase where some people were meeting in like the town hall and all spread out you know, with our producer spread out, <laughs> just zooming in. And then there was a hybrid phase where some people were online and some people were in the room. And then there was the next phase where everybody got on to Zoom and, you know, our, our towns were on a whole, like all of yours on a spectrum where some people were like, yeah, I do all this for work. I don't need any help. And we would just, we assigned a producer to, you know, to sit in on the call and make sure that it got recorded and do a backup recording. You'll be using OBS or whatever it was. And then I still have a town now that's just like today is going to try and go online. So, so you know, like, like you all know, um, we had a huge um, outpouring of interest in getting on BCTV as, as soon as we went off site from local journalists. Uh, who had like podcasts or interview shows on the radio or whatever, and they all just jumped on the bandwagon and they just started sending us shows. And so we became basically a like remote editing house and we still are. And normally this is something, you know, as my, my motto for this period is no rules in the shutdown, <laughs> which is we threw out all of our requirements, all of no releases, no membership, nothing. Just send us that video. We will edit it. And we will put it on. <laughs> and, um, Make it know, happen. Like, uh, and then we would identify sources like Tim Ash's um, daily update on Facebook. And I would just put in his comment, hey, I'm from a local public access station. Can I download this? Air it and put it up for other stations. And he'd be like, yes, that was it you know, and then that just started a change. So we were basically looking for credible daily news sources. 
and just getting a flood of people submitting shows to us. Um, and that's still the way it is where I'm seeing a live stream on Facebook or something and I'm saying, hey, can we air this? And they're like, yep, here's the video, you know. And um, so we're just doing, and it's been great because I can keep uh, my editors employed and I'm just saying, here you go. Here's this online content. Let's, let's you know, make it for cable. And that's, that's a lot of what we're doing. Um, we are starting to see, so municipal, all that happened. Church, you know, faith services, all that kept happening. They, all, they made the leap right away. Our weekly shows made the leap. We are starting to see requests now from arts organizations who are like, can you help us do a live stream concert, something like that. So I can see that that's the next thing that we're gonna get into is arts organizations trying to figure out how can I do a performance safely? And one of the ways I can do it is by not having the audience in the room. Um, and, and I can see that that's a, there's a role for our organizations you know, in that, um, that we're all gonna get. So I'm gonna just pause you because that's just a breathtaking amount of work to digest and every one of these centers have been doing this work. I know Angelique has a small, smaller center and I'm wondering what are you most proud of the change that you've made in your organization in the past six to seven weeks? Well, going remote was not that hard because we have a staff of basically, there's three of us and the office, um, uh, we did close pretty much right away, which was hard to imagine that just a few weeks before we'd had town meeting where everyone was crammed together in these little spaces, hard to imagine another lifetime. Um, but we, uh, so we switched to the remote and um, one of the things that was important for us was to, to keep sort of um, making sure the employees knew that their income was um, stable and our one um, full-time, uh, well not full-time, but our field producer that, that she was taken care of. So that was very important during the transition, like you're okay, things are changing, we're closing our studio, but you'll be fine. So that was very important for us. Um, and we, we've really been focusing a lot, um, as we have in the past, on our towns. And a lot of our, um, in the past we had sort of experimented with doing some meetings live, and now everything is live. Um, and now we are able to even offer to some committees and boards that we couldn't send people there to film in the past. Now we're like, give us your meetings. And they're like, we're not sure how to do it. But we've been holding a lot of hands and we love to do that. Um, and they've been holding our hands. We've been really working really closely with our three towns. Um, so that's been nice that we felt like we've offered a little something new on both on the internet to offer these live and on our channel. Can I ask you, how have you um, kept the staff cohesive I understand you have a small staff, but how how are you balancing, how are you managing a remote staff? Um, well, we do have like a, a weekly uh, talk where we chit chat with each other, but we got a lot of, you know, just communicating in different ways, whatever each person prefers. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of a little more what, like whatever we had built on in the past. Um, it's important to not over communicate <laughs> just because you're far apart. You don't want to be like on someone's back all the time. So there's a little bit of holding back sometimes, even though you really want to tell them about this latest thing. Um, so that's, yeah. And, and I just wanted to mention one thing that we're talking about new things we're doing this time. Um, we're a non-commercial station, so we don't run advertisements. Um, but at this time we felt it was really important all the work that our local businesses are doing and it was a reminder of how integrated we're a nonprofit but you know our world is the same so um we've been focusing on this new little series where people our businesses become film producers in a way and they use their cell phones and they film themselves like sort of um behind the scenes doing what they do um and it's really distilled for us too how important their services were whether it's making chocolate teaching Taekwondo or taking care of our animals. So um, that's been a really fun new thing that we're trying to produce. So it sounds like everyone has been doing different kinds of new uh, partnerships that they might not have done as intensely before. Jamie, the Fairbanks Museum is one area. Are there other partners in the community that you are working with that perhaps you were not as intently with them before? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, 
What we found was that uh, the usual amount of community events that were going to go out and help produce in the community uh, were going to be canceled. Those are going to be public events where there's a live audience. And um, so that was really strange to, to get a handle on the idea that, um, oh, wow, this isn't going to happen. But like um, Angeliki was saying, you know, we reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. We have two, Northeast Kingdom and St. Johnsbury, and uh, asked if um, local businesses are providing a service for COVID-19. Uh, we'll help them if they can record themselves. Uh, we'll try to get resources to them. They can do Zoom. They can do any number of things. Uh, we'll take care of the rest. Just get it to us, and we'll help put the message out there. So uh, that was a little bit unusual. Um, like uh, a lot of places, we kind of stay away from the profit world and the uh, commercial and retail businesses. But considering uh, the, the gravity of the situation, uh, it was like, okay, let's go, just bring it and we'll do it. And I guess a follow-up question I would have for everyone to think about is, we have spent a lot of time moving online and I'm wondering if you're seeing a bigger demand for actual television for to put programs on TV versus just online. Is that for me, Lauren? Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I said to begin with that um, there's a lot of things going on. And um, just to remind anybody watching, um, the in April, um, the Department of Corrections announced that 30 inmates were gonna be moved to St. Johnsbury and the roof blew off the community. It was just absolute outrage that we were going to have 30 inmates come to a county, Caledonia County, with two cases of COVID-19. Uh, we're talking about a small rural hospital. Uh, if things get out of hand, this is going to be really difficult. Uh, no brainer, live TV for the select board meeting. That was Friday the 10th, I think, that they announced that. And uh, we were live on the 13th with the St. Johnsbury Select Board. And there was a lot of uh, State House representation there, um, Department of Corrections folks, uh, everybody and anybody, people from the community. So we were doing that live on YouTube. And then um, just a, a few days later, um, a week later, VSC announced that they were gonna close or they had a proposal to close three campuses, including uh, the former Linden State College or NVU Linden. And again, the lid blew off the community and away we went. So um, those things, it was just, uh, we have to do this stuff live. Um, we weren't really prepared in some cases to do that, but uh, we just uh, shoulder the grind wheel, make it happen. So Rob Chapman, you've just joined us. Welcome, Orca, Mott Hillier. Um, we've just been talking about the kinds of pivots that we've done in the last several weeks in order to serve the community. And I, being in Montpelier, you have some, a lot of experience in covering the legislature, but then all of a sudden the legislature disappears. So what sort of adjustment did Orca make in order to bring the news of the governor's press conferences and the legislative activity to the wider community? So and there, I mean, those are two different questions. We had to deal with the legislature committees. I mean, we typically have this working paradigm where we would uh, look at an agenda for the committees during the week, and then we would pick and choose based on the agenda items that we thought would be of interest that might be in the news, that might be coming from the administration, and then send the camera operator there. And then all of a sudden that just blew up and they were no longer there. We, you know, there was this slight transition when there were we would send somebody to the house chamber or something like that, but it was getting more and more difficult to actually send camera operators. And they began to adjust to having their committee meetings remotely through a Zoom platform. And we had to begin to sort of look at the schedule and we began to follow the, the, the agenda. So we would you know, look at what they had done by checking out what they'd done during the week through the Zoom. And then we had to, to figure out how we were going to capture that. So we had to obviously, like most of you have gone through and adopted a platform where we have to um, take a Zoom or remote platform where that might be and then record that and then add branding to it. Uh, it took us about a week to uh, sort of uh, adjust to that new paradigm. 
but we we were able to do it and at the same time we were setting to setting up the network so that the staff could work remotely from their homes so which we've been doing for the past four or five weeks now i believe so you know we had a very frantic week there of just trying to adjust our workflow and our protocols and trying to figure out what to do with that and then we got to the governor's press conference which was you know they originally had been handling it through the governor's facebook live account but they were having technical difficulties with microphones and such. So, you know, they decided that uh, I think the, the biggest complaint was that people couldn't hear the reporters that were phoning in. So uh, they decided that they would just stop doing that. And then uh, Megan at CCTV and I talked about how we could, uh, you know, sort of fill that hole, hole, help the governor's office with some of the technical uh, problems. And uh, we were able to pretty scramble together some equipment and be able to get to the what turns out to be three times a week press conference for about COVID that the governor's been doing at the pavilion, get a stream going, uh, and then sort of uh, deal with different audio problems. I mean, we we for for the first few weeks we had different audio channels and we had to figure out how can we combine those into one because people who were viewing it and we were getting a lot of people watching on YouTube, who uh, you know if at home they didn't have both channels coming through their speakers they would think that they couldn't hear a particular mic because. The podium mic had to be, happened to be coming through the left channel. The, the the telephone mic happened to be coming through the right channel. And we had to figure out how to combine out of the camera without bringing an extra mixer to, into the mix. So we were finally able to do that. But I was uh, I'm absolutely stunned at how many uh, audio professionals there are in the comment section of the of the YouTube. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, what's it been like for you to manage your team remotely? Am I allowed to say that I hate it? Of course you can. Tell us why. What are you missing? What are you missing? I just, you know, we work really in a sort of newsroom atmosphere where everybody kind of overhears everything and, you know, you know what's going on just by being in within earshot. So uh, the first thing that I did the day we got back was start our own Slack workspace um, separate from Van because we had been using the van workspace to just sort of DM, uh, you know, as a sort of a sub channel. <laughs> and uh, so we set up our own Slack workspace and started using that. Um, and uh, that helped a little bit. We have a daily call every day at 10 a.m., which is our, when we're supposed to open. And um, we, I got, I ended up getting cable in my basement so that I could watch the channel because I do that all day long at the office and it's the only way I can feel like what we're doing is actually producing something, you know, <laughs> um, is to kind of see how it actually looks. So that, that helped me um, to see that all this shouting into a webcam was actually resulting in something being, a, being able to be viewed by someone. Um, and, um, you know, I created a new organizational chart so that all of our producers, all our field producers could see basically how all the handoff, handing off goes between from person, from staff to staff to staff to staff to staff. To staff. Um, so everybody could understand what their position in, you know, new workflow was. Um, anyway, it's, it's been okay. It's just not the way I want to work. And it just feels so inefficient. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it feels like the game of telephone a lot where I say something to someone, they say someone else, somebody else. And then by the time I'm seeing what gets produced, I'm like, what? You didn't, nobody did what I said, you know, and that's because I'm not directly talking to everyone at one time like we used to do. Yeah. Anyway, I think a lot gets lost in the translation. Tammy, it, are there ways that you are creating community and not just getting work done in your remote meetings with your staff with the staff yeah you know we have a group that has been together for many years so we know each other very well and i think that that's uh been helpful um two of my team members that are on the production team have terrible internet so that's been our biggest challenge in terms of connectivity with each other and production. Um, so one of my team members is driving down to our facility where we have 100 meg fiber internet and sitting in her car 
for staff meetings, you know, and it's been interesting because the weather's getting nicer and nicer. And yesterday she got to sit outside. So yeah. that was great. Um, so, you know, we were doing more frequent meetings in the beginning to adjust to the workflow because we've had to completely redo years of, of workflow development and, and redo it like, like all of you in a week. Yeah. Um, and we are using software. We, we, you know, the, the last thing you want to do as a manager or leader is in a crisis say, here, learn this new thing. Right. But that's what I did. And I didn't know how it was going to go, but it's turned out okay. So we're, we've also uh, migrated from using email to Slack, which can, th which is a software that can have us all seeing the same messages rather than, than email. So that's been, it was hard at first. I'm sure it was very annoying for the staff at first, but it's worked out really well in terms of us being able to communicate. Um, and I, I think we, I, I always try to take time for, for everyone just to, f to provide some personal, you know, what's going on in your life, how are things going? And at the outset, really, like Angeliki said, is letting people know that they're secure. And the most important thing is for them to get their life and their families together. Because if we can't help ourselves first, we can't help the community. And so that's sort of how we started. Um, but we, you know, we miss the pizza parties that we have, you know, every few months. And, um, you know, but at the end of the day, everyone is really respectful of one another and we know each other well, and we work well together. So, so we're, we're, we're moving on, you know, we're making it happen as a team as best we can, even with bad internet. Yeah. <laughs> Jared, are you starting to think about the transition back now that the governor has signaled? That uh, yes and no, because we're in a challenging spot where we're still in a high school. Um, so even when let's say my staff can go back into the building and can work, uh, are we going to be allowed to let community members into the high school? I mean, is, is, you know, they're going to have their stringent rules of who can enter and, and so forth. So it, it's going to be a challenge. Definitely. When we, we start to come back, um, you know, I've already let some of my staff members know that, Hey, you know, in a sense, if you need to go into the office for a little bit, you could work in the office where that, you know, we're a small enough entity, but, my my pro programming coordinator uh the who does the scheduling he was already working remotely one or two days a week anyway before this whole thing came through so he's like i'm okay i'll, I'll keep working remotely I, I we've set it up i can do it so so yeah it's going to be a challenge but i think we're ready to get back you know some of us uh, i am i've got two kids i'm watching every day so i would love to get back to the office but but yeah i think it's it's good it, being in a high school is going to be I, I don't know what that means for us. That's, that's going to be the biggest challenge, I think, for, for SAPA TV. Yeah. Angelique, um, tell us about something that has really inspired you in your community. You're so connected there in Richmond and around. Um, I was um, thinking about that. And I guess um, all this being far apart from each other, it's cleared up in our minds what everyone does really well. Um, like we have the nonprofit NOFA. Vermont in Richmond and they've really stepped up with their communications and doing so much work like to collect masks for farm workers or to collect money for farm workers. I mean, it's been very clear to us what they care about and they've communicated that really clearly to the public. So that's been um, inspiring. And that's the same for like our local grocery stores, you know, from like we have a lot of really small ones that are going the extra mile and you realize that you know how important these very simple things are for everybody at this time so that's just been inspiring to to see people even though we don't see them all the time kind of like it's really brought to the, the forefront what people do well and we hope that the same has happened with the work that we do so do you think that this period of time is making a stronger case for the need for community media Angela King? Um, yeah, because um, one of the things that, you know, speaking to other public media centers, um, it sort of took a little while to, to be in my brain. I was like, wow, we are essential too. <laughs> so it just, it, it took a little time. But once I knew that I was communicating it to my staff as an important kind of reminder, um, they never were asked to go somewhere they didn't feel comfortable. It's all been very voluntary, like we are essential and yet we have some options, which is nice in our position. 
Um, and just to go back to something Tammy had said earlier, it's also cleared up for me how important the infrastructure we each have is at this time. Because I was like, gosh, I'm really glad we got that one gig local internet um, recently. And boy, I'm sure glad we bought a new $30,000 server, broadcast server a couple years ago, which allowed me to remote on. I often edit at home and send all the files to work because the computer is better and the internet's better and it, it sort of does its thing from there. So all those choices along the way to invest in our infrastructure have been really important. Jamie, what about you when you look ahead? You know, you mentioned two really important community issues that has happened during this time and you don't have a lot of news outlets in St. Johnsbury, so you, you seem to be essential there, don't you think? What does that mean going forward? Yeah, I, I think that um, this was a, a big wake up call for us. Um, you know, the idea that Kingdom Access TV is an essential service, uh, we made it volunteer to come into work the first two weeks. Um, we did have two employees and we're very small. Uh, we've got three full-time people and several part-time people. So uh, one of the part-timers started working from home exclusively. A full-time person started working uh, at home. Uh, so it was really just Anthony and I coming in here. So it was really very quiet. I was in the admin office and Anthony was in the production office. and. Um, as busy as we were and the outreach that we were doing, uh, I started to realize how important Kingdom Access TV is uh, and you know, all of us together, uh, Newport Community Television. Uh, we're here in this vast uh, Northeast Kingdom and there's so little information that's coming out of other parts of the state that deal directly with our area. It can be very frustrating at times, but it can also be a situation where any KTV or KUTV is the glue that holds the community together with good, local, solid information. Um, you know, the advertising that we've been doing uh, shortly after this started, we were using taglines like um, uh, staying connected together. Uh, that's been in our newspaper and our rad radio advertising. And, um, you know, it's a great tagline, but it's very much the truth. Um, the idea that we're available, um, you know, I'm working on weekends. I don't know about the rest of you, but I said to my wife about the second week into this, every day is like town meeting live on KETV. <laughs> it's been just crazy. But um, emailing people on the weekends, evening, reaching out to religious organizations, uh, community groups, doing posts from Front Porch Forum to our Facebook page. Uh, really wonderful story about the Jones Farm, a local uh, farm organic growers, and they put together a list of 16 local farm stands in our area. And it's like, wow, you can get chicken, beef, pork, vegetables, applesauce, maple syrup. Uh, we really didn't worry much here in the NEK about shortages. Thanks so much, Rob. You've not only been trying to serve the community need, but you've also been involved in some statewide planning, such as the statewide channel that we have been talking about building as Vermont Access Network. And I wonder, when you look to the future, how viable and important do you think the work community media centers like your, your own are do? So it's, you know, I've been thinking about this quite a lot uh, and, 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 you know, Orca is unique in that we have the state house in our footprint. So we really do have this whole sort of uh, I, thinking about how do we serve the, the state with uh, access to what's going on in the state house. And uh, when this first came out, you know, started happening, uh, I got a call from the IT guy at the state house saying, we're trying to figure out uh, how can we do this if we are not in, actually in the state house and so you know he, he reached out and then they they figured it out they used the zoom platform to be able to stream to their own committee youtube pages so now every committee in the state house i think almost all of them now have a youtube channel 
that they can uh, connect with any, any constituent across the entire state. So then I began to worry, does that mean that we are now uh, antiquated because we, you know, it's now conceivable that after this is over, they may keep those YouTube channels going with some sort of a streaming camera in the, in the state house. So it'll be interesting for me to see, you know, do they continue to do this? It's been exciting as far as, you know, in the general sense in that, you know, any Vermonter can now watch any sort of committee that's happening. They don't actually have to be in that room, which has always been a problem because the committee rooms are so small and you have a lot of people that are trying to get in and listen to this important stuff that's happening in the state house. So, you know, uh, you know, we think about what, what's going to happen with the state house. Uh, you know, if the, every committee has a YouTube channel, do we, are we then no longer necessary? Do we begin to shift to thinking about covering the chambers in some sort of V-span way or something like that? You know, particularly in, in thinking about, you know, what are we going to be using this statewide channel for in 2021 as far as the legislative, you know. So it's, it's curious, you know, we can think about it. And then even on a local level, you know, uh, we have a number of smaller towns that just don't have the, the capacity to think about, you know, uh, streaming video. And so my board has charged me with sort, sort of, even before this happened, they, they sort of charged me with thinking about if you were going to set up some sort of way for them to be able to stream their meetings uh, automatically without our help, uh, what would that look like? And looking at what we now see with these Zoom meetings, there's a lot of pr uh, problems that we had with sending a camera operator into a meeting that are being solved. For instance, you know, anybody who's talking, they're the primary person that comes up on the screen. Uh, we can't do that. So you can, and so an activation is to being done by a microphone that's on a phone or on a laptop. And I'm like, could we use this to solve some of these problems that we don't want to invest all this infrastructure and capital money into? Could we take everybody who is at a meeting and they have their laptop or their phone and somehow tap into their microphone that's on that on that phone so that it's activated to a particular point that they're all Zoom? I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see what the future, uh, how, it, how, how it pans out. Cor, when Rob raises those questions, what goes through your mind? Oh, yeah, we're doing the, the same thing, which is we're covering all sorts of meetings that we didn't used to cover, like, you know, special meetings, the DRB of these tiny towns, the, you know, people are just making recordings that our legislature is having these, um, our delegations are having these weekend roundtable meetings on Zoom and sending us the videos. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what the cable viewers appetite for watching recorded Zoom meetings <laughs> is. Um, we kind of decided in this whole thing that our one of our big roles was bridging the gap between people who were online all the time and getting all their information online and people who were not as facile with that and not as used to that and who were still consuming media by watching cable. And so because you know, people who are on Facebook all the time are just seeing just this flood of information. So what we decided our role was going to be was taking that relevant information to our community and getting that on cable um, in a way that it could be uh, digested. And um, in that way, you know, is there a role for us to bridge the gap between people who are willing to, to go on to an online meeting, to go to meeting, <laughs> Um, and people who just want to know that their their local government is being covered on video and archived and they can watch it if they want to watch it and there's accountability and there's transparency. Um, so it's a great question. Um, I wanted to say about the the inspiration part, um, you know, I do having watched these select board meetings, a lot of them it is inspiring to see how many of them have really stepped up. Um, during this crisis. I mean, in my tiny town alone, there's like a mutual aid organization, there's a select board, there's the emergency. Um, people are knocking, going door to door, um, trying to make sure every single neighbor is okay. Do you need groceries? You know, what, you know, are you sick? What, how can we help? Um, and I just think we're seeing a lot of Vermont towns really, really step up in this. Um, and our channels are a reflection of that. You know, people get to experience that. Um, I also think that, um, you know, the, the staff dedication that you're all alluding to, where we all feel like we've been running a marathon since <laughs> March 16th, um, 
uh, it's been really amazing how, how staff has really been able to step up to learn new things, learn, learn Slack, learn how to use OBS. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I kind of hear sideways about how staff are just trying to help each other figure out how to do things. Um, and I find about it later and, you know, figuring out the home internet problem and the, the my computer doesn't work, my laptop is crashing, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what everybody has been willing to, to step up and take on in this whole thing. Thanks, Cor. Yep. Jared, I know that you've been involved in a regional discussion about how to be more, perhaps more efficient. Yes. Um, and I wonder, you know, does this time of uncertainty also create possibilities in terms of how you might work together differently regionally? Um, I, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I think for us, you know, some, some of the stations in this area that are part of the conversation, I think this adding this COVID-19, this shelter in place, gives them even more fear about what their financial funding, what their funding is gonna be in the future. So um, I think that, you know, I, it's a very smart idea for us to be having the discussions that we're having to look at, hey, how can we work together? Or, hey, how do we consolidate the services we're offering and, and so forth? So I do think that it's, you know, and I don't know if other stations throughout the, the, the state are, are looking at options like this, but I do think it's a conversation that, that is important that, and that, uh, you know, things, are, things could possibly change quick. And I think that having a, an idea and a plan to, uh, to maybe work together and to be able to continue to provide the essential things that we're providing is, is important. So, yeah, I think there's a, is, is a way to do it. Um, like I said, we're, we're early in the, the process of our, dis, of our discussion and I'm already wondering, wait, you know, how is this, how is this really going to work? How are we going to be able to provide the communities the same service if we do start consolidating these, uh, these things that we're, we're talking about? But I think there is a way to do it. And I think that in the future, it probably is what, is what stations are going to have to do. Uh, especially if we if we do see the funding drop drastically, I hope I hope we don't. But uh, I mean, I hope I answered the question uh, what you were asking. But I do think it's important to, to be having these discussions uh, and and looking to the future of of all all of us working together to make sure that we have a voice and that we're we're providing these services. Thanks so much, Jared. Tammy, you're looking forward to becoming the president of Vermont Access Network, which means you get to herd all of the 25 cats that make up this amazing resource. And I wonder what your thoughts are about the opportunities presented by this period for the movement of community media. Well, I have to share with you all that probably three weeks in, I think I was having a complete existential crisis about the work we were doing, why were we doing it, does it matter, is anybody better off, all of those questions. And it was probably exhaustion, stress, coping, you know. And I came out of that with a renewed sense of what's important and, and that we do matter. And part of what got me out of that tailspin um, was the feedback that I heard from my community about the work we were doing. I started getting thank yous. Hey, thanks for what we're doing. You know, and part of it, to piggyback on what Cora was saying, Bennington County's population is an older population. And so I had to remind many of our folks around that there are still cable viewers that are not on internet, that are not on Facebook, and we can't forget about them. And it, so, so I spent a couple of weeks just reminding everybody, all, all the stakeholders that, Yes, you had your meeting and it's available on the internet, but not everybody's on the internet and we have this beautiful platform. So that's, you know, that's something that, that I did. So I, I think that what's going to come out of this and what's coming out of it for me is a renewed um, sense of our mission and purpose and our relevance to the community. So I'm, ex I'm excited about how we're going to take the crisis and transform it to provide new services and also services in a different way. And it's, forced us to strip down our daily grind, you know, and, and, and really think about what's important. And so 
I, I'm kind of excited to see, you know, and I'm, and I'm confident that we'll all work together and come out of it uh, with, with a bigger and better uh, community media infrastructure and teams across the state. So I'm, I'm out of my existential crisis and into, you know, hope and future. And I'm excited. I'm excited about it. Does anybody else have any closing comments they want to make or questions for other folks in the on the call? And Gelly Kay, yes, go ahead. Mute um, yourself. There you go. Yeah. So just in terms of um, you know future planning for the Vermont Exodus Network that we're all a part of, um, this has been a reminder too of our like we pride ourselves in our very local communities, but it's been a reminder of like how important Rob's work does that they're actually sending a person to the state house even at this time to get us that clean feed of the governor's address. How important that is and all the work with the committees and. Um, for the first time we've been putting things on our community bulletin board that are not in our three towns. Cause it's been really important to look at things from a Vermont perspective. Um, so that's really something that we're gonna, I think, walk away from, from all this. Fantastic. Any other closing thoughts or comments? Jamie? I'll offer up that um, we would be doing what we're doing with Fairbanks Museum and others but if it wasn't for VMX, it wouldn't have the statewide impact. Um, you know, seeing that uh, 10 or more AMOs are downloading those educational programs for K through eight kids is uh, just awesome. And the idea that we can do it so easily through uh, the Vermont Media Exchange is just a wonderful resource to have. Yeah, thanks. That is, and, and you know, just so people understand who are watching, this is how programs get um, that someone might produce, like the Tim Ash Facebook interviews that he's doing now. It's an interview series. The fact that you're processing that to get it up and share it with all of us so we can run it easily is a great resource and very much appreciated. Well, I want to thank everybody. It's just been a pleasure and a joy. Um, and just before we close, we're going to just a quick lightning round on what it is that you're doing to take care of yourselves. Because I think Jamie might have intimated every day is a little bit like Groundhog Day. There's just, you know, there's, it's hard to know when it's the weekend and it's hard to know what day it is. And so what are you doing to take care of yourself? And maybe Rob, why don't we start with you? Because I know that you're very good at that. <laughs> Taking care of myself? I don't know yeah. about that. Well, you have a hedonist quality to you. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, part of it is just being able to spend so much time with my daughters. You know, we've been sheltered together with them and, and having the ability, you know, my, my oldest daughter was in her freshman year at college. So she was, that was cut short. So she's been home. And so being able to just to, talk about, you know, how, what it's like to be on a, on a, you know, in a global sense of what does, how this impact us, impacts us all and brings us together and to think about those things. It's just been really sort of interesting to, to, to watch the, it through the eyes of a 19 and a, and a 16 year old. So. Oh yeah, that is, that's a great blessing to be with them. Cor, how about you? Um, I'm going to have to think, go to someone else. All right, Jared, <laughs> how about you? How are you taking care of yourself? Well, a uh, four-year-old and a two-year-old are keeping me on my toes. Uh, my <laughs> wife works in the medical industry, luckily uh, on the more of the managerial side, but so she's gone every day. And so, yeah, I, but it, it's, it's been awesome to actually be around my kids. Uh, I actually got to see my little boy start walking. So, you know, if you have a fat in daycare, they probably would have got to, to uh, enjoy that. So, and uh, I'll tell you what, I never exercised so much in my life uh, chasing two of those kids around the house. So, uh they're, they're, they're keeping me, keeping me uh, very happy and very, uh, uh, let's just say tired at the same time. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm surviving and, and, and I'm keeping in touch with my staff and, and so forth. And it's just, you know, we're taking it one day at a time. Wonderful. Thank you, Jamie. How about you? How are you taking care of yourself? Um, well, you know, part of it is um, the, the physical uh, health considerations. Uh, KUTV has policies in place to uh, wear gloves where it's a shared computer or device. And um, it's been very difficult to get masks, but uh, we created some social distancing rules. We also completed 
the uh, VOSHA certification. And uh, for anybody coming back, I mentioned the people that are working from home, they have to have the certificate with them and put it on their desk when they get here. Um, the other part of taking care is, uh, you know, reaching out to people, which um, I, I'd like to think we've always done at Kingdom Access TV, personally uh, tracking down neighbors and making sure, especially elderly neighbors, uh, my mom, my stepmother, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, you know, making sure that these people are uh, taken care of, that um, they don't need something. And I think a friendly voice is a wonderful thing too. Yeah. Absolutely. Call and talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Tammy, how about you? What are you, what Netflix show are you watching? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you I have wish, time? I wish I could watch more television. Um, I have a five-year-old, so I'm kind of in, in the realm of full-time parent, full-time working, trying to manage it all um, with my husband. So I've been forcing myself to walk down the hill and back every day, even if it's cold, even if it's raining, and getting that physical exercise. And then also uh, t taking time for myself, even if it's 10 minutes, because, you know, we're home, right? Uh, the three of us. And so it's been interesting and it's been a blessing. Um, but I was told yesterday by my child that, that my attitude was not as fun as daddy's attitude. <laughs> so that's when I know, you know, it's, it's, I need to, to step away. And so it's been interesting and fun, but really just trying to get outside as much as I can um, and walk up that dang hill. It's, it's a killer. I bet it is. Yeah. Thanks, Court. Okay, I, I got some ideas from you guys. I am trying to get out a little bit outside and I have been um, gotten involved with the Neighborhood Mutual Aid Association and um, you know, checking in on neighbors and stuff like that, just anything. I think one of the hardest things about being in a crisis is feeling like, it, this particular crisis is feeling like you can't help anyone because we have to be distant. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, and that's not true. Um, and, but it feels like that. So, um, making a mask and, you know, knocking on a door unannounced. I've been doing that a lot. <laughs> um, my kids are both grown, so they're taking care of themselves. Um, and, uh, so, um, anyway, I'm just trying to get outside of my tiny pod, um, as much as I can said like a true community organizer. <laughs> Absolutely, I wanna thank you all so much. Rob Chapman of Orca, based in Montpelier, Cortro Bridge of BCTV, based in Brattleboro. Jared Ganell, based in Springfield at Sapa TV. Angelique Contes, who's in Richmond and thereabouts with MMC TV and Tammy Riley in and around Manchester with GNAT and Jamie Dimmick, of course holding down the fort in St. Johnsbury, part of the Northeast Kingdom. I want to thank you all so much for all the work you do and for sharing some of your time with us today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for so having much. us. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye. All right. Good work. Thanks.